Tonight's special presentation is brought to you by the Council of Yukon First Nations and Northern Native Broadcasting Yukon. Hello and welcome to NADA, your eye on the Yukon. I'm Rob Smith. The Yukon Native Land Claim Settlement has been a long time in coming. Tonight on NADA, in the second of a three-part series, we take a look at the early stages of negotiations and meet some of the key players. So sit back and join us on a long journey home. Chief Jim Boss, visionary leader of the people who've made the Southern Yukon their home for thousands of years. With the coming of the white man, he saw a whole way of life disappearing. Chief Jim Boss, the first to ask the government to compensate Yukon Indians for all that they've lost. No white man give us this structure. But not the last. Flip through the pages of world history you'll find a familiar theme over and over again. We're here to talk about our future. We are not here looking for a handout. We demand that the promise A moment in time when oppressed people rise as one against their oppressor. We are no longer prepared to be tolerant of forked tongues. Determined to regain respect. When I have to go to Super Value and buy hamburger, why can't they? instead of walking out the door and pulling the trigger. I don't know what more you people want. See, we own the land. We were the first people that were here. And restore dignity to their lives. For the Yukon's 8,000 First Nation people, that moment came on February the 14th, in 1973. This is the story of all that came before that historic day and all that came after. The Prime Minister's commitment to begin negotiating with the Indians is seen here as a landmark that could set the pattern for settlements with natives in other parts of Canada. The Indian Claims Commissioner, Dr. Lloyd Barber, describes the meeting as historic. Together today for our children tomorrow, a proposal by the First Nations people of the Yukon Territory. They'd never signed any treaties. Now they wanted compensation for all that they'd lost. They also wanted out from under the oppressive Indian Act. This approach which you have taken in here is one, therefore, which is uh, very welcome to the government. We think that it is... Uh... The fact the government agreed to sit down and talk about it was a triumph not only for the Indian people of the Yukon, but the rest of Canada. The paper together today for our children tomorrow had a very powerful impact on the thinking in Ottawa, which led to the question of negotiation. If you talk to Trudeau, he'll say it was legal. It was the Nishka case. It was so and so and so and so. I think he lacks appreciation for a lot of the subtleties that were around at the time and that had a bearing on it. And that, as I recall, the reaction of the Yukon Indian people when their paper was favorably received, that had a very, very beneficial psychological, sociological, almost physical impact on those people who had worked so long and so hard for legitimate recognition of their cause. And in that respect, I think it was a, a watershed. The proposal was fairly straightforward. Yukon First Nations people wanted land, money, and the ability to control their own lives. This settlement is for our children and our children's children for many generations to come. All our programs and the guarantees we seek in our settlement are to protect them from a repeat of today's problems in the future. You cannot talk to us about the bright new tomorrow when so many of our people are cold, hungry, and unemployed. 
A bright new tomorrow is what we feel we can build when we get a fair and just settlement. More than 200,000 square kilometers make up the territory, and the federal government controlled most of it. The First Nations people believed control of the land was necessary for their cultural and economic survival. They also wanted a temporary freeze on all unoccupied crown land until they could transfer the land they wanted to keep. Money. Yukon First Nations wanted cash for the land they'd already lost. They wanted exclusive hunting and fishing and timber rights on the lands and waters. And they wanted Indian representation on all land development and control agencies. They also wanted assurances that this settlement would not do away with any benefits or responsibilities of Indian people, which they were entitled to as Canadians. Back in the Yukon, reaction to this proposal was swift. Take this letter to the editor the same day the chiefs made their presentation. The law, as stated by courts in Canada, has consistently been that by discovery and conquest, the nation that did the discovering or made the conquest could deal with any people found in the land. Many non-native Yukoners, like letter writer Millen Roberts, were shocked by the proposal. They wondered why a settlement was being considered at all. They worried that a settlement would change their world dramatically. If, if these land claims do go through, doesn't he uh, think it would be only fair to subtract the amount of money that has been spent in the past on the Indians in any federal or territorial handout as, say, uh, public health, welfare, education, brotherhood, and band grants? You listen to it and you hear it and, and you feel bad about it. And geez, you know, we begin to question ourselves and thought, geez, what, what have we done wrong here? So when those backlashes happen, you thought, oh, geez, what did we do? You know, why are people so angry? Are the Indians not better off now than they ever were? And if they, if their want is to get back, to live off the land, would they not be satisfied if we gave them each a tent, a bow and arrow? and turn them loose on the land. Our claim was basically good in law, and, uh, and the facts were basically on our side. And I thought that's all was required for us to sort of sell the claim. And I was surprised that when we got back up here that in fact people were speaking against our claim and maintaining that we did not have any rights in law, maintaining that we all should have equal rights, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we were not equal uh, and uh, I was just, I guess, overwhelmed by the reaction that we got and I was very disturbed by that as well. Drop this term, special status people. This may have applied a hundred years ago, but not now. Pay each one of the families concerned a reasonable amount of money and be done with it and once and for all, call them Canadians. All of my friends were first-generation Canadians, and I kind of believed at that time in the assimilationist philosophy because these people, their parents had come from the old country, and whether they were Ukrainian or Polish or German, they kept their customs and their traditions and their clubs, but yet were assimilating themselves into Canadian society. Ken McKinnon was a member of the Territorial Council in 1973, a division formed within the council based on the merit of the claim. However, after a quick debate, it didn't waste any time trying to get in on the land claims process. Just weeks after the Chief's presentation in Ottawa, the Territorial Council passed a motion asking to be included in any talks. And at that time, I got to know very intimately some of the First Nations elders as friends. That's the other thing that I thought, uh, that I saw, was the absolute uh, love and oneness with the land, with the First Nations people. And even though I think that I love the Yukon, I'll never come close to that love of their part of the country. So I knew it was something more than the assimilationist process that I had grown up with. There is also division among the First Nations community itself. 
namely between status or registered Indians and those who are not registered, the non -status. Sometime in the near future with some answers. Elijah Smith, the man who started the land claims process, and the Yukon Native Brotherhood represented status Indians, but the non-status people felt left out of the claims process. They'd organized themselves separately as the Yukon Association for Non-Status Indians at the urging of Elijah Smith. Although the non-status had been in on the preparation of Together Today, when it came to putting the finishing touches on the document, they'd been barred from the meetings. We approached the, uh, the building to go and attend the meeting and we were told we couldn't participate, that we weren't part of it. And uh, that was where there was a fairly serious confrontation. The days that the meetings were supposed to happen, um, we were still trying to find out why our delegates could not be allowed to go into this meeting. And I can, I can remember very vividly a, a confrontation be between some of our women and the leadership of the uh, Yukon Native Brotherhood, where words were actually exchanged and, um, and uh, the leadership telling some of our women that it was their own darn fault, you know, that they married a white man. But I'd like to thank you all for your support, and uh, I will continue to uh, do... Margaret that. Commodore was one of those women, but she had no idea what she was giving up at the time. We made it clear that there was a lot of people that... Uh, that had lost their status through various reasons and, and a lot of people of Indian ancestry that had a right to be involved in discussions. It wasn't just whether you were Indian Act, Indian or not. But there were a lot of things that, um, that happened that weren't very pleasant. And a lot of them happened when land claims started to, um, you know, started to be a really big issue. And I'll never forget that you know, for as long as I live. If people think that you know, the, the joining of the two groups was easy, it wasn't. I don't think uh, Billy Weber chicken out, as you were saying. But by the end of the year, the two groups had come up with a solution. They'd form a third organization just to deal with land claims. They'd call it the Council for Yukon Indians. So YNB uh, decided to invite one of them, one member, to participate on the negotiating team. And it was rejected by Yancey, saying that they wanted equal participation and for a long time this was a stumbling part and uh, but eventually it was agreed to to have equal participation but that didn't solve the problem of defining who was an Indian and who was not it would take another six years to reach an agreement on that issue Yancey participated they weren't recognized as having any rights by the government and the first offer of settlement uh, showed that it was uh, strictly dealing with status Indians, in which the government offered $50 million and 100 square miles for each of the Yukon Indian bands. But the first offer was almost immediately rejected. $50 million and 1,200 square miles of land was not enough. The last time around, it was back was, to the bargaining there, there table. Was such a, a gap between... Uh, Opposition to the claim from non-natives, rather than going away as people learned to accept it, seemed to intensify. Yukon newspapers were flooded with letters suggesting Indians still kill each other, that they were primitive people, that land and money was of no value, Indians existed only by searching for food, and such a lifestyle was anything but civilized. If it wasn't for the white man's comforts, none of them would ever reach a reasonable old age. An organization called the Society for Northern Land Research was formed to fight the claim. It was spearheaded by a young man named Dan Lang, who went on to become a member of the Yukon legislature. These days, Lang doesn't want to talk about this period in his career, but back in 1975, he had no such reluctance. If you do take large tracts of land and make the exclusive hunting and trapping rights for a certain group of people, where does it leave us? Don't you think that it would be right for the government to maybe come and speak to the other side of society? Generally speaking, the attitude across the country was, in the abstract, people could deal with the question of claims. Because when it got very close to home, uh, the question of claims uh, was something much different. You know, when it's my pasture land that those damned Indians are going to get, they have they are not entitled to that. As long as it's somebody else's pasture land, that's fine. Yeah, the Indians have to be treated fairly and so on. Whether you agree or not, the natives of the Yukon believe very strongly and very deeply 
but it is their land. Well, I believe it's my land, too. I was born in Canada. I'm a Canadian. Well, I was born in Canada, too. But you say... I did not get a standing ovation. And I remember. Willard Phelps, a white earth lawyer at the time, didn't join Lang's group. Well, they very quickly established the membership of 3,000 people or so that paid dues to this, this organization. They were the, the precursor of the uh, Reform Party in the Yukon, I like to think. There was a hardcore of really not a moderate right, but a more radical right of Yukon people who just simply did not believe that there should be a land claim, period. Tell us, what do you feel about your land? Yukon what Indians were the first to be accepted at the negotiating table, the but they were not the first to reach a deal. That page in history belongs to the Cree people of Quebec's James Bay area. They signed a deal in December of 75. The Quebec government wanted rights to the area so that it could develop the massive James Bay hydroelectric project. The Nubi Alouette of the Western Arctic were also at the negotiating table. They called themselves the Committee of Original People's Entitlement or COPE. It would take them longer to reach a deal. Well, we weren't worried about the precedents they were setting. James Bay was a major hydro project and which forced you know, the government to deal with them. COPE had oil development. Uh, Canada was really interested in opening up the, the North Slope uh, for oil development. We really didn't have that in, in the Yukon. Our pressure points were not similar to those claims. As a result, there was more work for us to do, and it was a longer, harder claim to, accom to accomplish. Energy, or the shortage of it, played a big part in the claims process across the country. Some believe it was pivotal in getting the federal government to the table in the first place. North America had an energy crisis, or so everyone thought. That put pressure on resource-rich Canada to develop its supplies. The North had oil and gas, and the South needed it. The only problem, getting it there. Alberta was building a pipeline through its territory. The plan was to extend that through the Yukon into Alaska. Then the American gas could be carried to the markets in the southern U.S. Non-native Yukoners embraced the proposal, and the economic boom it was bound to generate. It does not present any of the problems of giving access to a virgin area. The Alaska Highway has been impacted. But Yukon First Nations had quite a different reaction. We will not tolerate abuses of our people and our land for the sake of development alone. Fearing yet another invasion on the scale of the gold rush and the building of the highway, Native people banded together to stop the project. But they were up against the power of money. There were people who said, the pipeline's coming, it's $40 billion, and the work up here is going to be fairly extensive. Let's get the contracts. Let's try to get as many contracts as possible. And um, there were some of us who said, no, you know, you can't be bought out. A similar proposal to the east in the Mackenzie Valley region of the Northwest Territories was nixed by the Berger Inquiry. After visiting the communities in the area and listening to what the Dene people had to say, Thomas Berger said the pipeline should be put on hold for at least 10 years. The for our in 1977, the Yukon had an inquiry of its own, the Lysic Inquiry. What is this thing called a pipeline that so many are afraid to even talk about? It's only one thing in my mind, it's a person of native ancestry and that's cultural genocide. And the bureaucrats try to figure out more ways in which Indian people can be swept under the rugs of the Department of Indian Affairs. It was pretty much of a big whitewash as far as I was concerned. There was no net gain in terms of native rights and in terms of recognition of the native people here. It was, um, you know, it, if, if the demand for that oil had been great enough, it would have been another Alaska highway. They would have just put that old pipeline through right there and... Uh... The benefits were so enormous for the contribution of this narrow little right-of-way of the pipeline through the Yukon 
once you got out and talked to the communities, once you got out and talked to the First Nations about the benefits, both uh, for the environment and for the pocketbook, you could overcome the event, original hostility. And by the time that we were going to the construction of the pipeline, the only problem was there was no market for the gas at the end of the pipeline because we dilly-dallied so long. We had every... The problem with that kind of development is the boom and bust cycle that it creates and it, it, so it creates a lot of problems, it bursts, and then you're left holding the bag with... Uh, when the next crunch, energy crunch comes, and it will come, to the United States, there's going to be some method, and who knows which method it will be at that time, of bringing that gas to market. They just cannot afford to let that incredible natural resource of gas sit there forever. They told you of their fears of the consequences of a stampede of southerners flooding into our land. People who will bring us increased problems with alcohol and crime, with abuse of our women. Non-status Indian. This is a term which hurts a lot of Indian people. One of the most unfair tricks ever used to wipe out a race of people is the enfranchisement. During the pipeline debate, land claim talks in the Yukon pretty much ground to a halt. But it wasn't long before they were back on track. First Nations people in the territory, both status and non-status, were represented by the Council for Yukon Indians at the land claims table. When it came to other programs and services, status Indians turned to the Yukon Native Brotherhood. The Yukon Association of Non-Status Indians did the same for those who were not registered. But having three separate organizations was cumbersome, and at times divisive. Participation and fitness of all people. Iona Campanola was Minister of Sport under the Liberals. She came to Whitehurst to dole out some recreation dollars. So uh, before I get a little bit serious, I'd like you to all stand up with me. Take a big deep breath and a stretch, as far up as you can stretch. Everybody lean over and touch your toes. Uh, in your speech uh, just now, you indicated that you had $500,000 uh, allocated for non-status Indians and a million dollars for status Indians. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just uh, wondering uh, why we are only allocated half of what they are when our numbers probably in the Yukon are greater. And when we continue land claims discussions, we're talking about only one group of people and we do not make any distinction. There's still some but native leaders like Harry Allen were directed by the elders to do something about the division. The comments, you know, from some of the elders saying they want their grandchildren back, uh, you know, let's work as one people, and um, and that was the beginning of it. So the organizations were charged with trying to come up with a form for one organization, which what we called amalgamation. It resulted in a uh, in a uh, committee representing all the, uh, the three organizations traveling around to the communities and and hearing both. Uh, opposing views and uh, favoring favored views you know on on how an amalgamation would happen years of talking and soul searching finally produced some results february 1980 an assembly is held to work something out once and for all four days into the meeting the yukon native brotherhood and the yukon association of non-status indians agreed to merge for Mary Jane Jim, who was on the Whiters Indian Band Council at the time, it was a painful process. I personally am on record at that amalgamation meeting as vote, doing a no vote, although um, my own personal opinions were in support of it. But under the instruction of my chief and council, I had to present a no vote. hit home for a lot of people and I think 
um, those people who were recognizing um, status only were protecting resources and then they didn't want to see them making the decisions at a national level for the organization or speaking on their behalf. And I think a lot of that went as far, it was discriminatory. It was a first for Canada. Nowhere else had Native people turned their back on the Indian Act, refusing to accept the barriers it imposed. It was a happy day for the Yukon First Nations. No longer were families divided. Here an Indian was an Indian by right of birth and not because the federal government said so. Even today when you, you compare what the Yukon Indian people did uh, in removing you know, the status, non-status question, uh, amongst themselves was a, was a major step, uh, I think, in Canada. Vic Matander has been involved with the negotiations almost from the beginning. Matander says the federal government didn't have much choice but to accept this. They wanted a land claims agreement with the Yukon Indian people, then that was one of the principles they had to accept. And, and so one of the questions that arose was, how many people were we talking about? So they set up a process to count, the Enrollment Commission. Gone were the terms status and non-status. They determined their own criteria as to who would be eligible to benefit from the claim. It was the first and only, to, to what I understand, uh, the only group that's uh, gone that far. At that time, there were a number of, of old people that were still with us that knew absolutely the history of First Nations. Shirley Adamson is the Grand Chief of the Council of Yukon First Nations, formerly the Council for Yukon Indians. So the convincing argument they put forward is that um, to negotiate a claim without including all of the people that had ancestral rights to the land and the resources and to their identity, uh, we had already lost the fight. Because Canada, as, as a foreign government, would have um, ultimately uh, claimed victory by splitting and determining who our grandchildren were. It was a major victory in the struggle for Aboriginal rights over Indian Act rights. Although Yukon First Nations were in the forefront on this issue, they faced opposition from the National Indian Brotherhood. I think there was a bit of a fear by uh, the um, National Native Brotherhood of what we were doing. We were doing new things that they had never, uh, like you could never think of amalgamating groups in other parts of the country. They were concerned about precedents being set that um, you know whatever they have the status Indians will be melted down uh, because they really had a conflict with non-status and Métis people and the other one is that um, they really wondered about you know whether or not Yukon was in step with everyone else and they were wondering whether or not Yukon was being very opportunistic but because Yukon didn't have treaties you know we could distinguish ourselves from from them we did, uh, amongst our people, make a, a major step forward and, and to challenge the government that, you know, their policies were wrong and, and uh, hopefully, you know, other Canadian Aboriginal groups can, can look at, you know, what we've done in the Yukon because, you know, there's many different groups in the, in the South. Hopefully they can begin to see the need to find forms that they can work together. And so they begin the new decade, Yukon Indians as one. But that wasn't the only difference at the negotiating table. By 1980, the Yukon government had its own negotiator, Willard Phelps. It had always wanted a bigger say in the talks, but it had always been met with opposition from Yukon First Nations. The YG came out very strongly that they wanted to be the signatures and we all ended up in a shouting match and our position was no way would we accept YTG's uh, signing authority to the final agreement. And Phelps would try to change this. The YTG, the Turkel government, were only uh, 
a third party player in terms of the negotiations between the natives and the feds because YTG is after all an instrument of the federal government. And they were then and I still believe today that they're not in a position to be negotiating with us for land. Ken McKinnon was never happy with the observer status held by YTG and remembers the arguments he made to CYI. The federal government has already made the commitment to the Yukon Territory government that they someday, through a gradual process, will become just like any other province with full responsibilities under the Yukon Act that those powers will devolve to the territorial government. So it's in your best interest that we work together as partners. The YDG was simply not welcome. They were seen as a, I, I guess, as, a, as another sibling struggling for the same rights and, and stuff from Ottawa. Born and raised in the Yukon, Phelps traces his family's history back to the gold rush. He served a brief term as an elected territorial councillor and was the Yukon's representative on the Alaska Highway Pipeline Commission. Although Phelps was technically part of the federal team, the territory was happy just to have a part in the process. I don't think YTG should have been there in the first place. Albert James, a member of the Carcaras Tagish First Nation, was with the Council for Yukon Indians at the time. Especially when they started making demands and started uh, wanting to do changes. They had plans for the Yukon and we were there to change some of our plans. I brought to the, the table the view that a settlement on any of these issues certainly had to be, obviously, first and foremost, fair to the Indian people. How are you? Dennis O'Connor was Ottawa's chief negotiator at the time. The Toronto lawyer had been a magistrate in the Yukon in the early 70s and was called on by then Liberal Minister of Indian Affairs, John Monroe, to try and reach a land claims deal. But I brought to the table a view that it was also important that the settlement be such that while it wasn't going to be accepted by everybody, that would be naive, that there be enough political acceptance in the territory so that when we looked 50 or 100 years down the road, this would not be viewed as an instrument of division. Willard Phelps says his first job was to establish the Yukon's role at the table. Well, we played hardball. I went down to, um, to Ottawa and, and uh, uh, they were just starting up their talks and uh, a bloodbath involved, uh, uh, evolved uh, between us and the uh, Department of Indian Affairs on the issue of our role. Uh, we wanted a memorandum of understanding signed that in, in effect uh, gave us a very meaningful participation. Finally, uh, it came to a head. We had a very acrimonious meeting with the minister and his, and his top level uh, bureaucrats, and, and they relented and signed a memorandum of understanding. Phelps says his mandate was pretty straightforward. My instructions at the time were um, to try to work out a, a settlement that would be seen as fair by all Yukons, Yukoners to give um, non-beneficiary Yukoners uh, the sense that somebody was there to uh, try to ensure they were being treated fairly. But the Yukon government didn't always get what it wanted, and in 1983, walked away from the table, bringing talks to a halt. Well, what happened was um, we had always been promised that once land claims was resolved and uh, settled, that uh, we would move very quickly ahead to, uh, to um, achieving responsible government. And Yukon really wanted to become a province and saw the land claims as uh, a lever, as a pressure point for them, for them to leave the federal government to agree to an overall uh, provincehood process for the Yukon. Late in the day, um, there was always a, a group fairly high up in the Department of Indian uh, and Northern Affairs who uh, jealously guarded their power. Willard felt they got, they got set up, yeah, they bought into a process that really promised not, them nothing in the end. And so we walked out of the, of the claims for those six or eight months. It was really a fight between us and, uh, and Ottawa. We had good cause to be highly suspicious. We wanted to go ahead without the Yukon government, but the federal government wasn't prepared to because uh, the game was played in Ottawa and the Ottawa people were going to shift it to the Yukon. 
and let the Yukon bear the burden of the land claims. We know that uh, YTG is going to uh, probably go after all of the other lands in, in the territory, so uh, we have to deal with that and we have to work with them. I guess the, the outcome of the whole thing was that we uh, start building a good relationship with them. YTG has their own agenda now. YTG has their own land claims now. They've got on, surfed on to their land claims on the backs of us, Indians. Of course, they want to settle it right away so they can start developing. Who all here would vote for Mr. Nielsen? And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, The situation seven, eight, at the federal level wasn't exactly stable. Within the space of one and a half years, the government changed three times. For Canadians as a whole. The Liberals had been in power for more than 15 years when they lost to the Conservatives in 1979. But the Tories didn't hang on to their newfound power very long. Within months, they'd lost a confidence vote, and by 1980, the Liberals were back as the government. For Yukon Indians, every change meant more delays. New ministers, new federal negotiators, new governments. I guess that was one of the more frustrating aspects of the process when every time there was an election or a change of, of ministers or a change of negotiators. Albert Peter, a northern Toshone man, has long been involved in the land claims process. We lose upwards of six months to a year of time where we had to basically sit and wait till the federal government or the territorial government got their house in order. One of the major stumbling blocks was the issue of land claims that crossed territorial and provincial boundaries. The Inuvialuit of the Western Arctic had claimed land in the Yukon in their settlement called the Coke Claim. The Taltans of northern BC were also claiming parts of the southern Yukon. The territorial government was totally opposed to these outside claims. We had just inherited the Coke Claim, which gave away the entire north coast. Busy trying to wrestle power away from the federal government, it viewed it as an assault on its jurisdiction. That was a bloodbath. It, uh, we, we finally won that thing. We got our jurisdiction back. Some in the territory were pushing for provincial status. However, Yukon Indians were asking for more than that. They didn't want to be just an extension of the Canadian government. They were asking for complete control. And they wanted this right entrenched in the new Canadian constitution. Trudeau had just recently brought the Constitution home from Britain, and native people across Canada wanted to have a say. Concepts of Aboriginal rights and self-government were now being discussed at the constitutional level. However, department policy at Diane would not allow these concepts in at the land claims table. The federal government at the claims table did not recognize Aboriginal rights, but yet insisted that they be extinguished or given up to get a deal. The Canadian government would not budge on this issue. In 1983, CYI would give in. During national constitutional talks held in Yellowknife, after hour discussions between CYI and Diane produce a compromise. In the wee hours of the morning, a deal is signed. CYI leader Harry Allen, with Diane Minister John Monroe in tow, head to Whitehorse to tell the Yukon people the news. More than 10 years after the Yukon chiefs had delivered together today for our children tomorrow, this headline announced what most Yukoners had long been waiting for. When our communities are planning programs of education, health, economic development, and have their own government, they will be well on the way to becoming cured. We lived without these people breathing down our necks before. We believe we can do it again. One of the big issues we had to overcome is, uh, well, what, you know, when you ask Aboriginal people who owns the land, well, they own it. When you talk about, you know, self-government rights, you know, they talk about, you know, owning and managing it and making decisions. Of course, the precedence at that point in time was 
uh, in terms of Aboriginal rights and titles was um, hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering rights. Uh, and to us, it was more than that. So, so it was, uh, you know, the difficulty of convincing governments that you know, there were rights uh, more than what uh, were being offered. Yukon Indians had reached a deal, a deal that included 20,000 square kilometers of land and $620 million. You know, it's the craziest thing because Harry and crew, Harry Allen, was in the Northwest Territories and they're meeting with the minister. He left a message and said, uh, please, you know, ensure that the, the, um, the chiefs are uh, brought into Whitehorse and we will be meeting with them. We're calling a board, emergency board meeting and we've, we've, um, we may have a deal. Rosemary Blair Smith was with the Council of Yukon Indians at the time. So I called the chiefs and they came into a, um, a meeting. What they brought in was two cases of um, champagne. Uh, the minister comes in and talks and I'm sure I wasn't alone in this. As I'm looking around the boardroom, realizing this may be a deal and I'm looking at uh, Chief Robert Hager's face and he was just absolutely furious. <laughs> and not only was he furious, um, he wanted to know, you know, like, what is this all about? You can't mean that we're concluding a deal when we have so many unanswered uh, issues that needed to be solved. This is an historic agreement. This will be a model. From my perspective, I hope it is, for the whole country, because it breaks so much new ground. YTG was left out of the discussions in Yellowknife and did not initially sign the paper. I express my disappointment that the government of the Yukon Territory, uh, no matter who sits in this position, was excluded from those particular discussions because we do go through the democratic process to be elected and speak on behalf of the people of the territory. The fact that he's actually signed an agreement is the most significant thing. If we've come, you know, over 10, 10, 11 years, we've come to the stage a couple of times before and we've refused to sign. And this is the first time that we've made a decision to go with him. I was really of mixed opinions. On one hand, I thought we spent enough time with negotiations. It worked seven years to, you know, to 10 years, in fact, to get to where we were at. But on the other hand, I really felt that we really didn't do the job at home. Uh, we really needed to take that time out to listen to the people. Just promises, promises, promises. And I think that's what people are looking at, you know, saying, well, you, you know, how many of these promises have you lived up to in the last 500 years? You know, people start looking at it and say, well, if you haven't done any good, so why should we trust you now? And I think that's where it was. It's just a, something that government threw out there to say, you know, we will do this, we'll put that in the Constitution. There is, the Constitution, they agree on, on constitutional rights specifically applicable to the Yukon. It's an override anyhow. You can't exclude it. it. You know, constitutional amendments are not Aboriginal rights. They're constitutional amendments and they override everything else. Potentially, there are serious contradictions. If the constitutional rights uh, created a form of self-government for Indian people, that would be inconsistent with the model of government that's been negotiated in our settlement. government to give up all of their title and rights to this part of the territory, what, what would they do? You know, like they're asking us to give up all of our title and rights. We'll get a good indication when this feeling principle does go to the communities and the communities have a vote on it. I think it's only right and reasonable as you can any people we expressed clearly to the government of Canada our opposition to the full extinguishment question so that we can have an opportunity to address those issues that we do not have not spoken to within the Grand Plains Forum. Yeah, it means I can get some sleep now for a while. <laughs> In effect, the Council for Yukon Indians and the federal government agreed to a clause saying, give up your rights now, and if you get them back in the Constitution later, fine. The Mayo Band would assume an independent stance from CYI. This Maverick Band disagreed with the whole concept of extinguishment. They would not accept it under any circumstance. They wanted the claim reopened. 
I was working hard fighting against Council for Yucca Indian. One of the chief approached me from Ross River, I think it was Clifford McLeod. He said, Robert, this land claim agreement is not very good. He's not going to go with it. I said, I feel the same thing. And then Stanley James came and called me up, and he felt the same thing. So the three of us got together. We talked about it, and we talked about that agreement. And I said at that time that I'll take this back to my council, but we're going to have to hire a lawyer to really analyze the whole agreement. Two more events that came in quick succession of each other would place more pressure on the council to reopen the claim. The much troubled Inuvialuit claim, first reached in 1978, was now up for federal approval. They received things that Ottawa flat out refused to negotiate with Yukon Indians. Then Prime Minister Trudeau made some remarks which the Council of Yukon First Nations believed meant self-government could be included in the talks. This statement was a clear contradiction of federal land claims policy. When asked, Diane Minister John Monroe said self-government would not be an issue in the Yukon claim. Rumblings of disappointment with the deal continued throughout the year. An agreed to formula for ratification of the deal was that 10 of the 12 First Nations had to vote yes to the deal before it could be accepted. Eight bands did just that. We took the attitude down there uh, that, um, that whatever agreement we got, we would work hard to make it work. Eh? Paul Burkle, longtime chief of the Champaign AGI First Nation, felt that it was time to deal. And then I, I agreed at that time uh, to go with it. We were getting tired of the process at that time. Then a telling vote would take place with the Carcross Tagish First Nation. They never spelled it out. Eh? They never spelled out the rights that you were giving up. But they, they said, your rights are extinguished. You know, you, you no longer have no rights. And so when we, we start sitting down looking at all that, and I think people start saying, well, you know, what does that mean, really? Stanley James is a Clinkett man who used to be the chief of the Carcross Tagish First Nation. People start saying, well, you know, does that mean I, I can't go hunting over here? Yes, that's what it means. Does that mean I can't uh, go camping over there? Yes, that's what it means. And, and what does that do to me as, as a Tlingit person? While well, you're no longer a Tlingit person, you're a, quote, Canadian citizen. And, and I guess that's where they changed everything around and said, no, we're not going to give up any of our rights. Ross River and Mayo were dead against it. They'd never been at the table. They had their own fears. And it just started to unravel because of those two uh, bands and their concerns, that, and, and because of inter internal strife within CYI. When the Carcross First Nation rejected the deal, Chief Robert Hager of Mayo realized that it was in trouble. One more no vote, and the deal would be scrapped. The deal's fate was permanently sealed at the General Assembly at Tagish during the summer of 1984. Chief Hager drafted a motion presented at Tagish to reject the whole deal. I guess when the, when the resolution was introduced, it was uh, like dropping a bombshell. People were concerned that, you know, all these years of work was going down the drain. There were many concerns, but the major debate would revolve around the extinguishment clause. Few First Nations agreed with the concept, but many felt that taking the deal now and gambling on the constitutional process was worth it. Mayo did not. Quite simply, he felt they didn't have the right. Hager had gone one step further. He'd sent the agreement to Vancouver lawyer Rick Salter for a second opinion. The assembly had started, and who showed up at midnight? Rick. And then we have to set up all night to, to, give us, to give us the result of what's in the agreement. We went to a um, meeting, and we had Art paid to do the report. And uh, one of the first things, I'll never forget what Art paid say was in in the agreement is that you're not going to be allowed to hunt the sheep. Man, you could hear a pin drop. And one of the elders got up 
and he says, you tell me, what did you see? Am I hearing things right, what are you saying? I think it's real difficult to, to have to stand up in front of people and say, all these years of work that we put into it is not enough. We need to do more. We had some uh, go-arounds there in, in terms of uh, a lot of discussion on the agreements and, and so on, and uh, the three First Nations um, wouldn't move, so uh, at that time, the whole process started to uh, fall apart. There's a lot of time that was expended upon sort of the old concepts that the Crown had maintained for a very long period of time. And we always maintain that that system that they had was wrong. And the documents that we had filed with the Crown from about 1973 to about 1979 were more conducive to the concepts that we thought our people could accept. Uh, things like retaining title, things like the right to run our own affairs, all of that had been advanced to the Crown, but they said, no, these policies do not exist now. And if you want a deal, you're going to have to accept the deal in the context of what is being offered. In my view, uh, we missed out on an opportunity for a really uh, good common sense uh, land claim that uh, delivered on, on many things, delivered on um, basic protection of, uh, of uh, Indian culture, uh, delivered on uh, a package that, uh, that clearly uh, spelled out uh, equality for all citizens uh, in the Yukon. It's fair to say the federal government considered it a, a good deal in the sense that, first of all, it was a deal, so that to reach an agreement in itself uh, was seen as, a, as, as quite an accomplishment. The reason I think ultimately it was not approved was it was part of the federal government policy that there be finality. And another way of saying finality is that there be a release, I'm talking lawyers talk, uh, so that, and another way of saying that is so that if the government entered into this deal, provide, transferred the lands and so on, that there would not be the prospect of litigation in the future surrounding Aboriginal rights. The government at before had gave me instruction that this agreement doesn't go through. We're going to shut down the land claim. We're going to be come way back, it'd be maybe 10 or 12 years, you would come back to the table. That's what the government had told me. I was a little disappointed because we, had, we knew we were up against the wall. We were told by uh, government officials that we, we would have to ratify this uh, agreement or else the whole thing would stop. From there, we didn't know where we were going to go. Uh, so that, that was my, my biggest difficulty. If they knew that I was fighting this agreement so, so hardly with my heart to get rid of it. And that's what they had told me. I said to them, I don't care if the land thing come back in place or not. As long as I have my Aboriginal right, my freedom to what I am as an Indian person. Determined to reach a deal, the feds gave the council up until the end of December to get support from 10 of the 12 chiefs. To up the ante, the federal government also cut funding to the council, forcing the organization to lay off most of its staff but the Yukon Indians refused to be bullied and the deal collapsed.